Hello and welcome back to the Space News Podcast. My name is Will and guess what's going on, man? There is a sun probe. I don't know if you guys knew about this, but it's a Parker solar probe and it just made its first orbit around the sun and it's ready to do its second orbit. And before I get into the Parker solar probe, I want to thank Emily B on Patreon for the $10 pledge. Thank you so much for all of your help. Also, if you want to help, if you want to help, just listen to the podcast. Also, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can also go to patreon.com slash space news podcast and help out there. There's some cool stuff over there that you can get for doing it. But not only do you get cool stuff, but you get to help other people learn about cool space and science things. That's what the Patreon is there for. It's so I can continue to do this and educate and help people learn the cool stuff that's going on in the cosmos. So Emily B, I want to say thank you one more time for your generous pledge. And let's get into what's going on with our sun. So on January 19th, 2019, 161 days after it launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base Station in Florida, NASA's very own Parker Solar Probe completed its first orbit of the sun reaching the point in its orbit farthest from our star, called Aphelion. And the spacecraft has now begun the second of 24 planned orbits, on track for its second perihelion, or closest approach to the Sun, on April 4th of 2019. Parker Solar Probe entered full operational status on January 1st, with all systems online and operating as designed That's known as Phase E, and the spacecraft has been delivering data from its instruments to Earth bearing the DSN, the Deep Space Network, and to date, more than 17 gigs of science data has been downloaded. A full data set from the first orbit will be downloaded by April. 17 gigs is about the size of a video game. If you download a a AAA video game, on Steam or Xbox or something like that, 17 gigs is a pretty decent size. So that's about the same size as a modern AAA video game. Andy Dreisman, who's the Parker Solar Probe Project Manager of the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, said, It's been an illuminating and fascinating first orbit. We've learned a lot about how the spacecraft operates and reacts to the solar environment. And I'm proud to say the team's projections have been very accurate. APL designed, built, and manages the mission for NASA. So they're really pumped about what's going on. And the project scientist over at APL said, We've always said that we don't know what to expect until we look at the data, and the data we have received hints at many new things that we've not seen before and at potential new discoveries. Parker Solar Probe is delivering on the mission's promise of revealing the mysteries of our sun. So in about two months' time, The solar probe will be doing its second solar encounter. And during that time, the Parker Solar Probe team will be analyzing data up until then and then after then and continuing until they don't have any more data to analyze. And then I'm sure other teams will take a look at the uh, data as well. And considering this is a NASA project, this is data that's going to be readily available to the public. So to get ready for this next encounter... The spacecraft solid state recorder is dumping all of its files that have already been delivered to Earth. So it's deleting all these files. They don't need them anymore. We already have them. We have the data set. And in addition, the spacecraft is receiving updated positional navigational uh, information and is being loaded with a new automated command sequence, which contains about one month's worth of instructions. So in April, Parker Solar Probe is going to be doing its second perihelion, and it'll bring the spacecraft to a distance of about 15 million miles from the sun, just over half the previous close solar approach record of about 27 million miles set by Helios 2 in 1976. So this thing is only 15 million miles from the sun. That seems like a large distance, but in space, in the cosmos, 15 million miles is absolutely nothing. And on its perihelion, on all of the the um, 
orbits around the sun, it's going to be answering questions. This probe is going to help us answer questions about the sun's fundamental physics, including how particles and solar material are accelerated out into space at such high speeds, and why the sun's atmosphere, the corona, is so much hotter than the surface of the sun itself. You can find more information about this on our website at spacenewspodcast.com. And we have a live feed on our Twitter account at Space News Pod and also on Facebook of any new stuff that happens with the Parker Solar Probe. So go check those out, spacenewspodcast.com and at Space News Pod. And next up on the news block is that an Israeli lunar lander has passed tests in preparation for SpaceX launch to the moon. Now, before I get to that, I'd like to talk about Patreon for two seconds. Two seconds here. Patreon is super important. I don't want to run ads on this. I really don't. And I think it's important that we try to keep this pod as free as possible from ads. um, Because this is all about science. This is all about education. This is all about discovery. So I set up a Patreon to make sure that I, I... don't want to have ads like that's basically what it comes down to i don't want to have ads if i have to i will but i set up a patreon so i won't have to and if you want to help out go to patreon.com slash space news podcast and become a patron help out i'm going to give you a shout out on the episode um and there's other cool perks that come along with it so that's it for patreon now let's get back into this israeli moon lander The managers of Israel's first mission to the moon say their lunar lander has passed a crucial set of tests in preparation for February's launch aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket with an assist from a Seattle space company. Space IL's lander is scheduled for liftoff from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida no earlier than February 18th. And mission success would make Israel the fourth nation to execute a soft landing on the moon following the United States, Russia, and China. Spaceflight, which is the launch logistics subsidiary of Seattle-based Spaceflight Industries, brokered inclusion for the lander as a secondary payload on a mission that will send Indonesia's PSN-6 telecommunication satellite, which is also known as Nusantara Satu, towards geostationary orbit. The flight plan calls for the Beersheet spacecraft, the PSN-6, and an undisclosed U.S. government satellite to be sent into geostationary transfer orbit. Beersheet would split off at an altitude of 60,000 kilometers, which is 37,000 miles, while the other two satellites would settle into stable 36,000 kilometer high, which is 22,000 mile orbits. The Israeli lunar lander got the name Beersheet. It's B-E-R-E-S-C-H-E-E-T, which I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that quite properly. It's a Hebrew word for in the beginning. I probably butchered it, and I apologize. The Israeli lander is designed to execute a series of looping orbits that will put 5.6 miles on the spacecraft, and that's going to be eight weeks long, leading to its capture by the Earth, or not the Earth, but the moon, the moon's gravitational field. So once it gets to the moon, the moon's gravity is going to take control. In this craft, it's about the size of a kitchen dishwasher. It's around 400 pounds when it's empty, but it'll carry around 800 pounds in fuel for maneuvers that'll lead it to the lunar landing in April. And it's, you know, it's round. It's round like a table and has four carbon fiber legs It's about 1.5 meters tall and weighs 1,290 pounds with fuel. And that's two-thirds of the weight. The fuel is two-thirds of the weight. So what's cool is on this, there is a a space-time capsule. It's a single space-resilient disk, roughly the size of a CD, a compact disk, holding digital files of children's drawings, photographs, and information on Israeli culture, and the history of humanity. So how cool is this? There's people that are working on mining the moon. There's people that are working on colonizing the moon. And Israel is sending up uh, images of hope, images of peace, 
uh, children's drawings, photos of human beings to go to the moon. So another cool thing is the capsule will remain on the moon and stay on the moon in the moon's environment for they want to do it for a couple of tens of years. So 20, 30 years until they can get somebody to send the spacecraft back or somebody who will bring this disc back. So I don't think it's going to be easy to send the spacecraft back. I think it'll be easier just to like put this CD thing in your pocket and then bring that home. But it's not just hopes and dreams up there. Uh, this lander is carrying a device to measure the moon's magnetic fields. It's backed mainly by private donors, including U.S. casino magnate Sheldon Adelson and billionaire Morris Kahn, who co-founded Amdocs, one of Israel's biggest high-tech companies. And when this thing gets up uh, past the Earth, it's going to split off from the Falcon 9 launch vehicle. It'll first orbit Earth in expanding ellipses. And about two months later, it'll cross into the moon's orbit and it'll slow down. It'll carry out a soft landing, which should not cause any damage to the craft itself. And then it'll land and there's a landing site between the sites of Apollo 15 and Apollo 17's landings. It's a flat area and it has small craters and a lot of boulders. So they have to be careful about those boulders. So once this thing lands, once all this, um, you know, rainbows and goodwill is up there and they're measuring the moon's magnetic field, what happens next? Where do they go from here? Um, well, Space IL, the Israel Aerospace Industries, signed a teaming agreement with German satellite manufacturer OHB System AG to provide a commercial lunar delivery system to the ESA, the European Space Agency. And the Lunar Surface Access, or sorry, Lunar Surface Access Service would handle payloads uh, uh, up to about 150 kilograms, which is 330 pounds, using derivatives of this lander. So this is the stepping stone for future lunar landers. Not only is it cool that it's taking stuff up now, this is a test. This is just a test to see what they can do, see if it'll survive. And if it does, there's cool stuff that's going to happen in the future. So OHB, which is the German satellite manufacturer, they partnered with Blue Origin, uh, the billionaire Jeff Bezos, the guy from Amazon. Uh, they partnered with them for a future moon mission that would use Blue Origin's large blue moon lander in the future. OHB released a statement and they said, we are delighted to have gained Blue Origin as a dialogue partner who has established itself over the past few years as one of the leading companies in the aerospace industry. We are convinced that the mixture of the respective competencies will quickly lead to concrete approaches to further cooperation. Sounds very corporate to me. Sounds like someone's going to be doing some serious moon business happening in the future. And Blue Origin, it's headquartered in Kent, Washington, and it plans to start launching the New Glenn from Florida in 2020. That's the earliest that they're going to start doing it. And the first Blue Moon mission to the lunar surface could take place by as early as 2023. So that's pretty cool stuff for lunar exploration in the future. Um, OHB is going to be a pretty big partner with this. Blue Origin, pretty cool, man. They're stepping up their game. And Israel is also stepping up their game to get some lunar landing uh, happening. So that's it for the Space News Podcast today, guys. My name is Will. I want to uh, say one more time, if you have a chance, go to spacenewspodcast.com. Hit me up on social media at Space News Pod. Uh, I got some DMs from people asking me about Patreon, so I thought I would just say it out loud today. I think it's easier that way than trying to type it over and over and over again. So if you'd like to support the podcast, here we go again. Patreon.com slash Space News Podcast. That's Patreon.com slash Space News Podcast. I'm well over 100 episodes now. I think we're 107. Not very, not very well over, but we're pretty, you know, we're pretty good. Over 100 episodes. I'm here for the long haul, my friends. And, you know, we're going to keep talking about space astronomy and science news for everybody in the cosmos. So for the Space News Podcast... I'm Will, and thank you for listening. I will see you soon.